All right, so we left off last Monday evening uh, with just beginning conversation on biochemistry. And we talked about the elements that are really important in biological systems. And really what it comes down to is if you want to be um, a scientist, it's a good thing to be a biologist because we get rid of like 90% of the periodic table and you don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about F shells and <clears throat> all that stuff. So very few elements are going to actually be important in anatomy and physiology and in biology as a whole. Uh, where I want to pick up tonight is with electrons. And um, the electrons are sort of a weird thing to think about. We don't really have great models of electrons and electron behavior. Uh, but what we do know about electrons, we can infer uh, based off of some really introductory kind of chemistry and physics type, type things. Uh, so what we do know about electrons is they rotate around an atomic nucleus. Now, the atomic nucleus contains neutrons and protons, and the neutrons and protons in the world of atoms and subatomic particles are the heavy boys. The electrons really add no weight into the element. Their weight is so low that we can basically ignore it, or the contribution of their weight, when we're talking about atomic masses and things like this. But even though they're basically weightless, and they're not really truly weightless, but for all intents, intents and purposes in biology, they are weightless. Even though they are weightless, they're still going to be very important when it comes to building macromolecules that are going to get incorporated into the cell, which are going to get incorporated into tissue, organs, organ systems, the organism. The reason that electrons are so important is because they provide the ability to bind to other materials to produce and basically emerge new chemicals. And the binding uh, for most of the uh, molecules that, and atoms that are going to combine come from things that are called valence electrons. And I'm going to abbreviate tonight electron just as an E minus. So that's my abbreviation for the night. So it's these valence electrons that are going to determine <coughs> the bonding qualities of an individual element, bonding qualities. And in fact, it's these valence electrons defining the bonding qualities that become important in physiological function. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically take you through a, a variety of different uh, types of chemical bonds and the characteristics that arise that are beneficial for uh, that are beneficial for biological systems. And I'm going to start out with a group of molecules that are known as ions. And these ions are going to the particles with a charge. And how do we actually get that charge? Well, that charge is going to exist because we either have an extra electron that adds a negative charge, it has a more negative influence over all of the protons, or it has a missing electron, so the protons have a more positive influence. Okay? So whenever we have a uh, particle that has a charge, either a negative charge or negative charges because of extra electrons or positive charges because of extra protons or really, you know, reality, a lack of electrons, we have an ion. Now, in the world of ions, you can have basically ions that do two different things when it comes to their valence electrons. If an individual molecule has between one and three valence electrons, that particular atom will always donate its electron. 
Now, we just lost an electron, right? So what happens to the overall charge of the atom? It becomes more positive. So I lose that electron, that molecule becomes more positive. And now that it has a positive, it actually can react with negatively charged ions. And we're going to find that we get negatively charged ions in molecules that have between four and seven valence electrons. So these atoms will accept electrons that are lost by our one to three valence electrons. Now, this can occur in single atoms or it can occur in larger mo molecules like large proteins. We actually can lose some electrons from big long chains of amino acids to cause that chain of amino acids, the proteins, to become more negatively charged. And in fact, that's what we find on the inside of the cell. We have these things that are called immovable anions. And so if I sort of model out a cell with a cell membrane, and I can put in a big negative sign right in the inside of the cell membrane in the intracellular fluid, the ICF, separated it from the extracellular fluid. And that indicates that the negative or the inside of the cell has an overall negative charge. And the reason that is is because we have ions, many of our proteins and nucleic acids act as ions, losing, or I'm sorry, gaining electrons to become more positively, more negatively charged, having that influence inside of the cell. And this is going to come back when we begin to talk about um, other uh, organ systems functions, things like uh, contraction of the heart, contraction of skeletal muscle, movement of sodium and potassium across the cell membrane to cause other physiological functions. So if we have something like sodium chloride, which you recognize as table salt, and we put it into an aqueous solution, maybe it's a glass of water, or maybe it's the intracellular or extracellular fluid, fluid inside of a, uh, a living organ, organism, what we actually have, or what results, is a change in the interaction. And so the interaction occurs in which we have an exchange of electrons. In the case of sodium chloride, the sodium is actually going to give up an electron. The chloride is going to accept that electron. And we're now going to have a negatively charged chloride and a positively charged sodium. And this results in what's known as ionization. We have this movement of electrons between the different atoms of sodium and chloride leading to this ionization. And in this interaction, the exchange that occurs, we can name these uh, participating particles based off of their overall charge. When we have a negative ion, it's going to be called an anion. Okay, so the anion is going to be our atom that's negatively charged or the piece of a protein, the part of a protein or part of a nucleic acid that's negatively charged. The part of this interaction that gives up the electron, which becomes more positively charged, is going to be called a cation. So cation is going to be a positive ion that loses an electron. The anion is going to be a negative charged particle that gained one electron. So let's talk even a little bit further here just to sort of bring everything together. And we'll talk about sodium and chloride and their interaction. So when sodium and chloride interact, based off of all the information I've given you, I should be able to get you to participate here. So I'm going to tell you that sodium, when it interacts with chloride, loses an electron. So if it's losing an electron, how many valence electrons would the sodium have? Between one and three valence electrons. So one to three valence electrons, and really what it is, is it has one valence electron. And it has what are called three energy shells, which are where the electrons basically reside around the atomic nucleus. Okay? So, if I have one electron to lose, and I have three different shells, 
the final shell is only going to have one electron. It loses that electron. The sodium now has two complete shells. Two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell. And so now it's actually stable because we'd like to have our valence shell, our outer energy shell, full of as many electrons as possible. In order to do that, though, by losing the electron, the protons in the nucleus now have a much larger effect. And so sodium is going to have an overall positive charge. Two shells, and in the last shell, the outer shell, eight electrons present. Now this is, again, interaction with chlorine or chloride. And if I tell you that chloride gains an electron, then we know that it had how many valence? Four to seven valence electrons. Now what do you think we want to have happen here with the chloride? I just told you that sodium, we were really comfortable when we had two electron shells and one of those shells was fully filled, the outer shell was fully filled with eight electrons. What are we going to do here? We're going to gain one and we're still going to get our full electron shell. So that electron that we gained, we originally had three electron shells. The outer shell had seven electrons. It's now just picked up another shell from the electron donated by the sodium. And now we have three full shells. And in the outer shell, eight electrons and a negative charge. Okay, so now if I rewrite the sodium and the chloride after this interaction, sodium is going to be positively charged and chloride is going to be negatively charged. Now, what do we know about opposites? Opposites attract. So sodium and chloride are actually going to interact. They are not sharing electrons, though, because remember, sodium donates the electron, chloride accepts the electron. There is no sharing of the electron in the outer shells between the sodium and the chloride. Rather, they have this attractive force. And what this attractive force is going to be called is an ionic bond. So we form through this process of exchanging electrons an ionic bond. And there are actually a variety of chemicals, a lot of them that are dietary chemicals that you will consume that are ionic bonds, or the chemicals are in an ionic bond. You consume sodium chloride, that's table salt, and it has an ionic bond. Now, this is the way that exists in a dry environment, and you can sprinkle it out on the table and you would see the little crystals of salt. What happens to salt, and I'm sure you've all done this before, you put it in a glass of water. What happens? It what? It dissolves, or it basically disappears, right? And really, it's not disappearing because you can take a drink and you're going to taste the salt. So it's still there, but it incorporates into the watery environment. The same thing's going to happen in our cells, right? Because all of our organs and all of our tissues and all of our cells are basically bags of solution. And when we put ionic bonds into an aqueous solution, a water-containing solution, the bonds dissociate. Okay, so normally when sodium and chloride are in their dry environment and we have table salt, they're actually neutral. There is no charge. The sodium and the chloride, one's positive, one's negative, they bind together and in that relationship the positive sodium um, cancels out the negative chloride. Then we put it into water. In the solution, uh, in, the, in, in the glass or in your cell, causes those bonds to dissociate. And now I reintroduce a positively charged sodium and the negatively charged chloride, and we say that these molecules have ionized. So whenever you consume table salt or calcium-containing compounds, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, these molecules are going to dissociate and they are going to form ionized particles. You're going to have now charged particles. And what's really unique about this 
is when we have those charged particles in a solution, they actually have the ability to conduct electricity, and they are going to be very important in maintaining homeostasis of a variety of different organ systems. In human physiology, we refer to most of these as electrolytes. You've all drank Gatorade before. Gatorade says we have the balance of electrolytes that the human body needs during uh, exertion and exercise. Uh, and so when you drink that solution, you're getting these ionized particles that we call electrolytes. And simply put, electrolytes are particles that ionize when they're put into water, whether it's the Gatorade that contains water or the cells in your body that contain water. So again, because of the presence of these electrolytes in the extracellular fluid and in the intracellular fluid of uh, tissues, these solutions can conduct electricity. And conducting electricity means that we now have the ability to generate signals. And by generating signals, we can coordinate activities across different cell types. And that leads to the maintenance of homeostasis in a variety of different physiological systems. Okay, so just exchanging electrons is an important aspect of physiology helps us to create electrolyte solutions in and outside of the cell that are going to help to pass signals around that help to balance homeostasis. We are also going to have distribution of electrons that form these things called free radicals. And free radicals are an important enough topic to discuss that we're going to handle that here. And this is related to the function of electrons as well. So what we already know, electrons are normally paired. So in the valence shell of, let's say, uh, chloride, the reason we gain that extra electron is because we have seven electrons, or in reality, three and a half pairs. We have three full pairs of electrons, and we have one electron that doesn't have a partner. And so we're seeking to give that electron a partner because electrons love to be paired up. They love to be in pairs. When electrons are not paired, they go out and they seek a, pair, a, a, bond, or a, a, a partner, someone that they can partner to. In some cases, this is a very aggressive search procedure, finding uh, uh, an extra electron. When it is that aggressive, so to speak, we call these free radicals. So a free radical is going to have electrons that are not paired. That means it will have an odd number of electrons. Now, free radicals form for a variety of different reasons, uh, and you can sort of see um, some of the reasons listed out here. So they form for many reasons, but even though they form for many reasons, we know that energy is always going to be required. Okay. So what are some of the reasons? Well, there's just simple metabolism. Things that are happening to produce ATP and energy in the cell will result in the production of free radicals. Uh, inflammatory response causes the production of free radicals. Environmental things, smoking and pollution, ionized radi ionizing radiation and ultraviolet light all can cause free radicals to form. And most of the time, it's just molecular oxygen which has a covalent bond, two, uh, two individual oxygen atoms, and the oxygen loses one of those electrons, forms a hydroxyl group, and then a free electron. And now we have this free radical that is in your tissue or within your organs, 
And when that free radical is allowed to persist, that unpaired electron aggressively seeks a partner. Now, when you begin to think about this, we're trying to find other molecules that we can steal an electron from. And we know that things like fats and proteins and DNA and carbohydrates are huge sources of electrons. We have tons of atoms in a lot of these molecules with tons of electrons. So these are great places to go and scavenge and steal electrons to pair up the electron in the free radical. And if we leave this unattended, the free radicals will attack and steal their partner electron from fats, from proteins, and it's especially bad when it's DNA. Because now we're disrupting that DNA molecule, and we are actually going to change or even lose some information, some vital information that could be important for cellular function. So these molecules of fats, proteins, and DNA, the electrons can be stolen. And when we lose that electron, we have a tendency to lose the bond that the electron was just stolen from. Or it gets reorganized and it is no longer under the same important physiological condition. Can that be chemical like, condition. condition. Sorry, can, can that be like the, the reason for like different, I guess, the mutation or whatever? Yep, absolutely. When we destroy the, the DNA, when we damage the DNA, it can cause some mutations. Sometimes these mutations can lead towards what's called an oncogene, which is going to be a cancer-causing gene, and then pretty soon that cell is producing cancerous, um, cancerous byproducts. Yeah. Okay, so like, does, so our body doesn't produce like free radicals. Yes, it does. It does. Yep. The, some of the metabolic byproducts that are produced in cellular respiration are going to be free radicals. Okay, and, and that is, okay, so like if our body is producing those, then couldn't we then also pass <clears throat> that along to our children or no? It's not like, like, cause you know, it's our DNA. I don't know. Okay, yeah. So you're saying like we produce free radicals, or we we consume a cigarette and we get free yeah. radicals, and we just damage our DNA. Yeah. If that happens in the what's called the germline, which is where the sexual gametes are produced, ovum and, and sperm cells, if we have damage in that DNA there, then very yeah, very much you could you okay. can pass that off to offspring. Absolutely. But fortunately, it's not just like, oh, well, you got free radicals, it's all over. We actually have a variety of ways in which we can combat free radicals. So the other thing that I want to talk about before I go on there is when I steal my electron from the DNA, the DNA is now missing a, an electron. So the DNA becomes a free radical. So now the DNA is going out and trying to seek another electron, or that little small section of the DNA where the electron was just stolen from. And so we get this chain of events that happen where basically we get a free radical that forms and it steals an electron, that becomes a free radical, steals another electron, that becomes a free radical, so on and so forth. So we sort of have, as free radicals are formed, the, the DNA or the molecule that is being attacked becomes a free radical and we get this chain reaction. Now all of a sudden we've altered a whole bunch of DNA, or we've altered a whole bunch of proteins, or a whole bunch of fats, and we're beginning to impinge on the integrity of our, of our cells. And this is going to be a real problem. Fortunately, we do have ways to defend against this. To defend against free radicals, we need antioxidants. And an antioxidant is just simply going to neutralize the effects of a free radical. Basically, the antioxidant is going to be really good at giving up an electron to neutralize the free radical and then to be expelled from the system or excreted from the system or neutralized some other way. Antioxidants, there are going to be two types. One type is called a genetic antioxidant, and we actually have enzymes 
that can take free radicals, pop a free electron back in there, catalyze that reaction, and eliminate the free radical threat. Uh, one of the most common free radical, uh, anti, or, uh, I should say, antioxidants, naturally occurring genetic antioxidants, is an enzyme called superoxide disputase, which I personally believe is like the superhero name for all enzymes. <laughs> so it's pretty sweet. Um, and so that would be a genetic example. We have a variety of different antioxidant type uh, enzymes that are scavenging those free radicals and neutralizing them. Catalase is another example. There are also going to be environmental antioxidants. And when you hear environmental antioxidants, think about think in terms of something coming from outside and going into the body. So this is going to include vitamins and certain other minerals like selenium. These are going to be molecules that you consume in your diet that are going to scavenge free radicals, donate out a, an electron, and they're not really going to become a, a, a huge elect, a free radical threat and will just be excreted. Okay? So things like pomegranate juice. Pomegranate juice is supposed to be high in antioxidants. Blueberries are supposed to be high in antioxidants. You pop a couple blueberries, and you're going to get the benefit of those antioxidants as you digest those berries. So whether it's a genetic or an environmental source, the antioxidants are going to pull off an unpaired electron, and this ends up resulting in a less harmful substance than the anti or than the uh, free radical. Less harmful substance? Yeah, less harmful. Pretty good. So all that's like avoidable by just simply changing with your diet? Uh, well, I mean, it's not totally avoidable. You're still always going to produce uh, free radicals. Uh, you can't get around the metabolism. You know, we're constantly using oxygen, and that oxygen occasionally is going to be broken down, and we're going to lose lose an electron and form a free radical. Um, you can't entirely get out of the sun unless you live in your mother's basement and have painted all the windows black, which makes you a weirdo. <laughs> Some of these things we can avoid. I mean, we don't have to smoke. We don't have to... Well, for the most part, we can avoid air pollution unless we move to L.A. or a big city. Um, ionizing radiation, limit your exposure to x-rays and things like that. Don't go stand at night under the power lines and look up. <laughs> so some of these you can definitely avoid or limit your exposure. Some of them, inflammation, the inflammatory response is actually, um, it, it is important because it helps to mitigate certain disease processes, and then especially cellular respiration, we, we can't do without that. But yes, you consume or change your diet, have good genetics and change your diet, and you can really eliminate the effects uh, and, and reduce the, the potential and the rate of DNA damage. So like when they're searching for cancer, are they searching for an antioxidant that will kill the free radicals, or are they searching for something different? They have, they've actually, I've seen, I've seen uh, studies where they've looked at antioxidants. Um, most, we're going to get off subject again, I can already tell. Let's not get off too far. Uh, let me first state that I don't think there's such thing as a cure for cancer. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure that it's, that it's possible. I just really don't think so. I think we can mitigate the disease's effects really effectively, and in fact, we're already doing that for a, a lot of different types of cancer. Right now, survival rate for breast cancer, as long as it's caught early, is, is over 95%, which is, in my mind, really, really hard. you got a, more of a chance of getting hit by a car and dying in a car accident. Um, some diseases, or some cancers, we, we don't have a handle on. Pancreatic cancer is basically a death sentence for most people. Um, I don't think antioxidants are necessarily going to be all that good for pancreatic cancer. It's understanding the genetics and what's going on behind the genetics, personalizing the medicine. I, that, that's just kind of my opinion on that, I guess, so to speak. Um, so no, it's not just simply 
let's find a really good antioxidant or give people super uh, super super oxide dismutase injections and, and help them to uh, to uh, eliminate their DNA damage. Yeah, um, I guess just from family Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's opinion. I don't right. think it's probably held. Another opinion that I have that's not held is I don't think we should be paying any money to do AIDS research because we already know how to cure AIDS. Right. And we're right now uh, we're right now getting billions of dollars in the United States AIDS research, and I, I don't really agree with that. I think there are other diseases that we don't have a clue about. You should run America. <laughs> <laughs> I should what? You say you should run America. I should give you a Nobel Prize. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> you mean like... <laughs> <laughs> we need to be together. Look at him, he's flattering. <laughs> no, no I, I got like this argument in my mind right now. Because Obama won a Nobel Prize. But he didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> he basically said, I'm going to... Make world peace, the world peaceful, and like, like oh, give me a little prize. Yeah. And so, like, in one sense, I mean, I think back on like the people who won the Nobel Prize and the great contributions to society and medicine and chemistry and physiology that they've made, and then they get lumped in with Obama if we didn't do anything. <laughs> so, what's the point of the Nobel Prize? Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather get a Bell Award. Nobel, I'd rather have the Bell Award. I don't know. <laughs> we'll make that point. So if the Nobel Committee is listening to my lectures, I am going to cure obesity. <laughs> I'm going to cure it someday. I hope the check is in the mail. And I'll receive that soon. <laughs> All right, so moving on back to our lecture here. Molecules, when they are combined together, two or more molecules, they form these things called compounds. Whenever we look at compounds, compounds are going to be designated in two ways. They can be designated structurally. And we do this as a structural formula, which is basically just the way that we sort of model what's going on. An uh, example of a structural formula would be that. Do you know what that is? Water. Or the molecular formula. Which would be H2O which is more of a statement on the ratio, the number of hydrogens and oxygens in the compound than a formula statement. Now, where compounds become reasonably important in biology is in what's called isomers. And isomers are going to be the same chemical formula, but a different structure. <coughs> and why these are important in biology is because most of the enzymes that catalyze reactions are super specific. So I got a picture here of some enzymes. These are glucose and fructose. These are hexose sugars. Are we OK? Oh, everybody's like war wounds. <laughs> so, I don't even remember if this is a Fisher's or a Hayworth projection. So, I mean, whatever. So, glucose and fructose. And as you look down through this chain, you're going to notice that things like what carbon the carboxyl group is attached to is different. Um, in when we just make that small little change, 
it causes these two molecules with the same molecular formula to act completely different in physiology. So let me give you an example. Glucose can interact with an enzyme called hexokinase. Hexokinase is the very first enzyme in the glycolytic pathway. Fructose cannot interact with hexokinase. Glucose is actually going to be isomerized to fructose as we move along the glycolytic pathway. We start out with glucose, becomes glucose 6-phosphate, then gets isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate. And they are distinct molecules. My lecture must be right on the night. <laughs> <laughs> what is the isomer under? Oh, yeah, I think it's Roman, Roman numeral 2, but I don't have every Roman numeral one. Oh, is that what everybody was panicking about? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Yeah, it was probably a supposed to be. A and then a Roman numeral right. 2. And that's supposed to be a B or that's supposed to be a Roman numeral 1. We can call it a Roman numeral 1. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks like a Roman numeral 9. It's like a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. So molecules to compounds. We have structural formulas and molecular formulas, and then whenever we have same chemical but different structural formula, we get an isomer, and isomers act physiologically different in biology. We need to deal with chemical bonds now as well because we're taking individual molecules and we're putting them together, and they are going to associate together through a chemical bond. So we need to kind of know what a chemical bond is and, and what types of properties those chemical bonds actually create. We've already talked a little bit about one chemical bond, and that was the ionic bond, and I'm just going to go back over that real quick right now. So an ionic bond, it's actually going to be between two charged particles, two ions, that are going to be attracted to each other. So this is an attraction between our positively charged ion called a cation and our negatively charged ion called an anion. So the cation and the anion are attracted together because opposites attract. Now there's no sharing of electrons. This is an electromagnetic or an electro, uh, electrical force that holds these together. And we can disrupt this if we put it in the water. So we will break ionic bonds whenever we dissolve that solution or place that solution into an aqueous environment or a water-containing environment. Okay, so we already know probably as much as we'll need to know about ionic bonds, but we haven't hit on covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds are going to be bonds in which pairs of electrons are going to be shared. We know that electrons are lonely when they're not paired up. One of the ways that we can pair electrons up is we can take odd numbers of electrons from one molecule and odd number of electrons from another molecule and share that odd number across what's called a covalent bond. So you can see here in this figure we have single electron in each of these molecules and then they get shared. And they're in that paired relationship and everything is copacetic. When we share the electrons, the sharing of the electrons is what is known as the covalent bond. Now, in human physiology, covalent bonds are immensely important. But really, two types of covalent bonds are immensely important. They are going to be single covalent bonds, where we have one paired, uh, a pair of electrons that are shared, or double covalent bonds where we have two pairs of electrons that are shared. So whenever we share electrons between two molecules, that compound contains a covalent bond. Now, the thing about covalent bonds that's pretty interesting here is the covalent bond is going to create a variety of different characteristics that are unique and important for biological systems. One of the characteristics that is important is a characteristic known as polarity. Now, 
Now, the term polarity basically means that you have opposite things occurring on either side of a molecule, uh, either side of a political, pers uh, uh, political spectrum, either side of the globe, the Earth. Right? The Earth is polarized because we have a North Pole and we have a South Pole. Politics are polarized in the United States because we have Republicans who are pretty conservative and we have progressive liberals who are really far left. Really far right, really far left in their beliefs. So they're polarized. Uh, covalent bonds can become polarized. Now it's not just um, opposite things happening, but there's reasons for opposite things to happen in a polar covalent bond. But to understand this, I really have to get into a concept known as electronegativity. How many of you have heard of electronegativity before? Okay, good. So we have some background in electronegativity. Hopefully this goes well. Because of <laughs> physical and mechanical properties of atoms and protons and neutrons and electrons, atoms can exert pull on shared electrons. So in this figure here, this of course is a molecule of water which forms a polar covalent bond. The oxygen is going to exert a larger pull on the electrons. And what that means is the electrons spend more time associated with the oxygen or around the physical space consumed by the oxygen. So whenever we have the atom exerting pull on shared electrons, when the electron is pulled to an atom to itself, we call that electronegativity. So the atom pulls the electron towards itself. This is the electron, I'm sorry, is the atom's electronegative characteristic. And in fact, when you observe the periodic table of elements, you are going to see that there are different amounts of electronegativity depending on the atoms that we're talking about. Hydrogen has a very low electronegativity, which means it doesn't pull on the electrons all that much. Oxygen has a very high electronegativity. So oxygen has a very strong force that pulls the electrons towards itself. Okay. When we have equal electronegativity across the covalent bond, so if we have two carbon atoms that have the exact same electronegativity because they're both carbon, so they would have the same electronegativity, the electrons are equally shared across that covalent bond. And since there is no buildup of electrons on one side of that atomic bond, uh, versus the other side of the covalent bond, we say that it's nonpolar. The electrons are distributed equally between those two carbon molecules. So it's nonpolar. In other words, the electrons are shared equally. If we have a covalent bond where one of the atoms has a higher electronegativity, so a higher electronegativity in one of the atoms, the shared electrons are going to be pulled more effectively towards the higher electronegative atom. And because of that, the electrons spend more time near the physical space of the high electronegative atom. So the atom that has the higher electronegativity is going to have the presence of those electrons more frequently. Is this making sense to everybody? Now when this happens, if you look at the covalent bond, and I have one side of the covalent bond, let's call it the right side of the covalent bond, and I have the left side of the covalent bond, we are going to have electrons that consume uh, space on the left side or the right side more frequently, wherever the more electronegative atom is in that 
relationship, and we say that it forms poles. In other words, we now have a polarity that exists. And I'm going to come over here to this figure here in just a minute of water to sort of illustrate this. But before I do that, the poles that form, one because it becomes negatively charged because we have electrons on that side of the covalent bond more frequently because the electrons are being pulled over there by the electronegativity, and one side becomes uh, positive. So we have a negative and we have a positive, and those are opposites, and that's polarity. So this sidedness that can occur or can form because of negative and positive sides of a covalent bond is going to be our polarity. And we're going to represent this with the Greek letter delta, which I know that's not a great delta. This would be a lowercase delta. And this is just simply the variable that we use to describe this sidedness in a polar covalent bond. So over here in our diagram of water, hydrogen, and actually let me even draw this up. Okay, so we have oxygen that is covalently bonded to hydrogen, and there's actually going to be two hydrogens. Oxygen has an electronegativity. I'm just going to put an arrow in there and then an E and an N. Oxygen has a very high electronegativity. In fact, it's one of the highest electronegativities on the periodic table. Whereas hydrogen here has a much lower electronegativity. Okay? So the covalent bond, again, this is a pair of electrons that are being shared across this covalent bond. Now, because this is a much higher electronegativity, what happens is the electrons, rather than having an equal distribution and spending equal amounts of time in this physical space, they actually begin to collect over here towards the oxygen. Now, because the electrons spend more time here around the oxygen and less time here around the hydrogen in this covalent bond, we begin to have this negative influence here by the oxygen, and we have a positive influence here by the hydrogen. So this covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen becomes polar because of the sidedness. Positive by the hydrogen, negative by the oxygen. Everybody doing okay? So what's the consequence of this happening? What's the consequence of creating a negative hotspot and creating a positive hotspot? That sidedness, when it forms, can create attractive forces. The negative side of the water molecule can now attract positive sides of other molecules. It might be another water molecule, but it could be the positive side of another uh, type of molecule altogether, a protein or a fat or carbohydrate. And so we get this attractive force. Now, in a biological system, where these forces that are created, these attractive forces are created, what they allow to happen is the formation of what are known as H-bonds. We're going to take a short...